Welcome to 10th or Tuesday, Episode 9. My name is Michael Bolden here with... Michael Meharry. Awesome. Today, uh, we're going to do an update on a number of bills that we've been tracking on various issues. And last episode, two weeks ago, Episode 8, Mike, we were talking about various ways to advance the right to keep and bear arms on a state and local level, and also at the same time, efforts to nullify federal gun control. And there's a new bill from State Senator May Beavers in Tennessee that would, I guess, the way I look at it, it would essentially make the state of Tennessee a sanctuary state, the entire state, for the right to keep and bear arms vis-a-vis federal gun control. That was uh, Senate Bill 146 that you reported on there. Yeah, definitely. And that's exactly it's a great way to put it, because that's exactly what it would do. It would end enforcement of uh, federal gun control laws. It would effectuate some uh, legislation that was passed a couple of years ago in Tennessee uh, that kind of set the stage for this bill. And so this is the next step forward. And it would actually the the bill previously uh, prohibited enforcement of any gun control that violated the Tennessee Constitution. And then a, a subsequent bill that was passed last year uh, prohibited the enforcement of any international gun control that violated the Tennessee state constitution. And this actually puts meat on, meat on those bones. Uh, you know, there was nothing in those previous bills to actually determine what specific actions violated the Tennessee constitution. And this would uh, effectuate that legislation. And it would essentially ban enforcement of all federal uh gun control in the state of Tennessee. So outstanding bill and and excited to see it move forward. Yeah, Senate Bill 146 in Tennessee, that's going to withdraw the state from providing any material support, resources, enforcement uh, to assist in federal gun control or any international agreements, treaties, etc. that would create any type of gun control uh, in the state of Tennessee. And that would address a lot of things that are already on the books. Uh, Senate Bill 146. Another issue that we've been monitoring really closely over the last few years has been asset forfeiture. This is where, uh, Mike, as you've reported so many times, where basically uh, police are charging someone's property with a crime and it can't defend itself, so it just gets taken. So just on the mere suspicion many times of a crime, people lose money, cars, houses, whatever it may be that, uh, that police keep. This, But then in a number of states, like here in California, uh, there were laws that passed that really restricted this. But instead of actually following the state law, law enforcement would then partner with the federal government and use the federal equitable sharing program to do an end run around the state law. So we've seen a few states already uh, work to close that loophole in many situations. And a bill in New Hampshire that's House Bill 614 is up for a hearing on the 1st, uh, that's tomorrow, to actually, all they're doing is taking a, a New Hampshire asset forfeiture law that was already passed and then dealing with the federal issue. Is that right, Mike? Right, exactly. It just uh, the uh, legislation that was passed, I think it was actually last year, okay. tightened up and, and reformed uh, New Hampshire's asset forfeitures laws, made them much stronger. And this actually would be a follow-up piece of legislation that closes the loophole. They did not close the loophole in the bill last year. So they created a situation where it's much more difficult for law enforcement in the state and and local level to seize assets under state law. But they can still pass these cases off to the federal government without any problem and actually Mm -hmm. bypass the new reform. So uh, this law that they're uh, proposed that will be heard, uh, you said, tomorrow. So that's outstanding. This will actually close up that loophole, so hopefully they'll pass it. And yeah, the process I- in New Hampshire, it's first the the bill's going to go for a, a first hearing, then it has to be uh, set up for a follow up hearing, usually uh, what they call an executive session. Then all bills in New Hampshire, this is a very unique process. There, all bills actually get a vote on in the state house. Right. So whether the 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 committee votes yay or nay on the bill, they're either saying inexpedient to legislate, that's their version of trying to kill the bill, or ought to pass. They're basically making a recommendation to the full House. So the first hearing on House Bill 614 is tomorrow, uh, I think it's somewhere something like 9 a.m. Eastern Time, House Bill 614. And another bill uh, that's trying to do some of both of these issues at the same time in, Atlas- in Alaska, that's House Bill 42. So it's working to, it looks like, Mike, uh, reform the state-level forfeiture and then also deal with the uh, the federal loophole at the same time. 
Exactly. And if I remember correctly, that bill would require a criminal conviction before the state could proceed with asset forfeiture in most situations. And then it does close that loophole in most cases uh, as well. So basically a uh, doing it what New Hampshire is doing, but doing it in one step. And uh, one of the things that I think is interesting, you know, last year we really started tracking these bills and a good number of asset forfeiture reform bills ignored the federal loophole. Right. And this year, the vast majority of the legislation that we're seeing introduced actually does address this loophole. So I guess word's gotten out and uh, these legislators are aware that, you know, basically without closing the loophole, your your reform at the state level is almost useless. I mean, I hate to say that, but no, you know, it's actually it, it really well, is. I would say it's useless in practice without follow up. So New Hampshire exactly. could provide to be a great example where they they tightened the state level restrictions, and then if they follow up uh, and pass this HB six one four this year or something in a future year, then this shows that you can take a step by step approach. A lot of places you you. You can't necessarily rely on that. It happened here in California, of all people. Jerry Brown signed a bill that uh, we worked on for over a year, supporting a number of organizations to do that to actually deal with the federal uh, federal loophole issue, the equitable sharing program. So it can happen, but you always have to keep that in mind. If you're willing to take a smaller step forward to support something, recognize that there's always more steps to be taken. And even in many of these situations where they're dealing with the federal loophole, maybe we need to close it even tighter because they're dealing with most situations, 80, 90% in, in some states, let's get it to 100 over time. But we have to build these foundational steps forward. Another issue I want to move forward to on now, Mike, is stingray spying. And you've done a lot of report reporting and writing on this particular issue. Give us a rundown, first of all, of what these their cell site stimulators, the brand name from Harris Corporation, was a stingray from a number of years ago. Give an overview of what that is. Yeah, basically they're devices that allow law enforcement to spy on your cell phone. And these things are, are incredibly intrusive. Not only can they track individual phones, so you know they get a say, well, look, let me back up and explain how it works first off, and then, then you can see just how intrusive they, these things are. Basically, they spoof a cell, cell tower. So what they do is they overpower the tower in that area. I like that, overpower the tower. And uh, once they've done that, it forces all of the devices in that area to connect with the stingray instead of the tower. So now the police have all of these phones attached and, and uh, tracking in on this uh, stingray device. And through that, they can track individual phones and they can even listen in on conversations, they can get into content. So it's an extremely intrusive thing. And, and not only that, it's it's not really targeted. It, it grabs any cell phone that's, uh, or any device actually that happens to be operating on, the, on that cell technology. It is totally indiscriminate. It's 100% yeah. opposite, it's or, or it's a 180 from the way that uh, the, the American system was set up, basically, and then most state constitutions as well, is that you're supposed to target someone based on probable cause, a warrant saying that this person needs to be surveilled for whatever reason we're investigating a crime. Not just because, oh, maybe your neighbor might have committed a crime or a concern that they may in the future, so you are now also under investigation. That's not how it's, supposed to, how it's supposed to go, and that's what these cell site simulators, these Stingray devices do. Exactly, and you know, I would argue that really I'm not sure that these things should ever be used at all. I don't think that they can be used within constitutional parameters, but, but at the least it should require a warrant right. before the, the law enforcement deploys these, these things to track or to uh, uh, listen in on conversations. And I think the Illinois bill that passed last year and was signed into law, I think that's the model because what it does is it, it completely prohibits the, uh, the listening in or accessing of content on the phone and only allows for tracking and it only allows tracking with the issuance of a warrant. So I think that's kind of the model that we want to shoot for. But uh, any type of limitations on these things are key. We're actually monitoring 10 bills on Stingray spying so far. We expect to see a number of other uh, bills introduced. Most recently, uh, a report that you had uh, filed, Mike, uh, in New York State, Assembly Bill 371, is basically taking this approach, right? It's, it's going to restrict it 
uh, to warrant situations. Is that yeah. correct? Warrant, warrant in most situations, it would allow for the use of these things in an emergency situation, which is mm-hmm. pretty carefully prescribed. And, you know, it's interesting. I was when I was doing the research for this bill, uh, I came across a report we actually put out over the summer that there were a couple of cities in upstate New York that had acquired the, these Stingray devices or oh, were using right. them and nobody knew it. They spent right. like, I think it was $550,000 on these devices. Was it Rochester? The, I think Rochester was one of them. And then there was, there was, there was two towns in that, uh, in that general area. Okay. And, uh, you know, it illustrates kind of the, um, one of the really creepy things about these Stingray devices is that they're so often they're purchased without anybody knowing it. Uh, you know, they'll use these asset forfeiture money that they've got tucked away so they can buy it off the books. And then they sign these non-disclosure agreements with the federal government, which even prohibits them. Sometimes they don't even uh, reveal their existence in the court of law. Like they'll actually drop cases so that they don't have to reveal that they have these things. So Yeah, my uh, understanding is the FBI, anytime that they sign one of these non-disclosure agreements and someone wants to do in discovery, talk about the use of a stingray, uh, the the agreement basically stipulates kick it up to the FBI. And then the FBI at that point will basically say, and uh, I'm not sure how often this happens, we should do some research or maybe we'll find someone else who has done this. Uh, they're basically saying, okay, drop the case. We'd rather lose the case because they're trying to find out about the use of these devices rather than actually uh, share any information about it. So this is a really nefarious stuff. It's good to see Assembly Bill 371 in New York, along with nine other bills around the country so far, and uh, maybe we'll get to 15 or more. But uh, this is a very important issue that we'll be watching as well. And one that I think is personally very important as well is industrial hemp farming. This is a product Industrial hemp is used in in, in clothing and uh, as a replacement for cotton, for example. It's used in o- uh, oil instead of maybe motor oil, for example. It's used in food, granola, protein powder, supplements. All kinds of products are made out of hemp. And we are monitoring right now 21 bills that uh, deal with industrial hemp farming or the legalization of hemp uh, in various degrees. In Hawaii, the latest are, there's uh, three of them it looks like, Senate Bill 163, and the companion House Bill 773, these are just to literally take—you'll explain this a little bit more, Mike. Uh, and then there's the third bill, Senate Bill 1052 uh, in Hawaii, is more similar to one that we're watching in South Carolina, House Bill 3559. Why don't you break down the differences in the type of legislation that we're talking about, Mike? So there's basically two approaches we're seeing states take to industrial hemp. And the first thing that people need to understand is the federal government essentially— prohibits the production, uh, cultivation of hemp uh, within a state, except for uh, research purposes. And in order to do the research purposes, you have to get federal permission. Uh, And so states are are basically saying, you know what, we're not going to deal with this federal law at all. So they're they're approaching it in in much the same way as they've approached marijuana. We're going to legalize it at the state level. If the feds want to try to enforce it, let them go ahead and try. Generally, they're not. And uh, there's two different ways that the uh, state can approach this. The first way is simply to remove it from the list of uh, prohibited substances from their uh, from their That's the first two substances. bills. Those yeah. are the ones in Hawaii, Senate yeah, Bill 163 I, I, and House Bill 773. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. If I, if I remember correctly, those two are companion bills, so they're identical, one filed in each, each chamber of the House. And so basically what this does is it makes, at least as far as the state concerned, it makes hemp just like anything else, like tomatoes or lettuce or, or anything. You can grow it, sell it, do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Uh, it removes it from the controlled substances list, so there's no threat of prosecution at the state level, and opens the door for uh, farmers and, and producers to begin growing the crop without any interference from the state whatsoever. Um the other approach that we're seeing is to actually create a regulatory program for hemp right. at the state level. So this would require – usually requires licensing and some oversight at the state level. Uh, and what this kind of does is it – you know, I, I think there's – from a practical standpoint, I think there's uh, benefits to both ways of looking at it. I sure. love the idea of not having any uh, any type of regulation at all. But sometimes that regulation at the state level encourages the market a little bit, I think, and, and kind of legitimizes what's going on uh, in, in terms of allowing farmers to do it. And they feel a little bit more of a sense of, oh, well, yeah, we can do this. This is a legitimate thing. So I think both pro- approaches are valid. And the important point is they both undermine federal prohibition because both open the door, and, and once people start uh, 
producing hemp once the research gets going, once people realize the the huge number. I think they've something like 24, 25,000 different uses for industrial hemp. It's, it's an amazing crop. So once those markets begin to develop, they will quickly grow. And as they grow, they will overwhelm federal prohibition. So then the two bills that, uh, Mike, you were talking about with the uh, the regulatory program, uh, that's Senate Bill 1052 in Hawaii and a South Carolina House Bill 3559. I, like you, I actually really prefer the idea of just decriminalizing, saying, hey, we're going to treat this, like you said, like tomatoes. It's, it's, it's a plant. People grow it. They buy it, sell it, etc. But we've also seen, so in some areas that seems to be a, a good approach. In some, in other areas, it doesn't get any results because the general public isn't necessarily Rothbardian in their viewpoint and how they deal with the federal government. And they like hearing that, okay, we're going to to uh, create this licensing program and you can go ahead and do this now. You now have our permission. So we've seen that kind of play out very similarly in Oregon, for example. I know you've done some reporting over the last year or so on that. It's been real interesting to watch how the market has developed in Oregon as uh, you know, the the first bill that they passed when they first legalized it was very, very restrictive. Uh, the, the licensing program was almost draconian. And as it's gone along, they've loosened it up and loosened it up and expanded the, the program. And we've seen a great deal of activity and a lot of acreage of hemp being planted in this in the state of Oregon. So in this case, it has worked. You know, it's it started off being something like you kind of cringe when you see it, but it was a good first step, and we've seen well, it going expand. even further back with Oregon. My understanding was that it was legalized, and it was basically just decriminalized. Say, hey, this is legal to grow, and there was no uh, no state regulatory scheme put into effect. That was like the first step a number of years ago, right. and no one did anything. So no one grew anything. No one took action like uh, the people in Vermont saying, hey, we're going to take the risk. We've done. Uh, right. We've got a video that I've just finished cutting that we'll be putting out on this uh, hemp program in Vermont where people are just saying, hey, we're going to do it. We don't need the, the state right. uh, scheme behind it. And then Oregon came in with this really restrict restrictive scheme and then – as you've been covering over the last few years or maybe the last month, uh, last month, last year or so, right. uh, there was a new law that went into effect that actually opened up the markets even further. Exactly. So, yeah, and like, like you said, it really just depends on the, the attitude of the people. You know, I think the in South Carolina, you have a, a dynamic very similar to what you have out in Oregon. Uh, they actually legalized hemp, uh, I guess, two, two years, years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, it was a, it was a relatively limited... It basically said, you know, you're authorized to grow hemp, but I don't think there's – from what I've heard, it hasn't been really something that's picked up. So maybe, you know, this this next step, the bill that, that's been introduced there for this session, maybe if that's passed, then we will see it uh, uh, actually – take root, so to speak. I hate to use that term because it no, sounds... No, puns are <laughs> all intended here at 10th or Tuesday. Absolutely. Every pun is on purpose. Right. So again, the bills, uh, in the second tier of bills there on hemp is Senate Bill 1052 in Hawaii, South Carolina, House Bill 3559. We'll be monitoring those and the 21 total or so that we've been watching so far around the country on hemp. Uh, next week, I don't know if you've got a, a particular kind of goal that you got anything that you think we should be talking about, Mike? I don't know. That's, you uh, know. No pressure, I mean. <laughs> well, I think that um, I think it'll be interesting to see what's moving. You know, I'm kind of interested in, in some of the things. I just was finishing up a report on the uh, on a bill that passed out of committee in Virginia on uh, on direct primary care. Okay. So I'm kind of interested to see how some of these uh, bills move along at the state level to address Obamacare and, and the National Health Care Act, not knowing what Congress is going to do. So, you know, that'll be something to kind of look at to see how those move forward. Well, let's keep an eye on that, and maybe we'll come up with a, a theme. Otherwise, I do like covering these kind of highlighted bills and categories. And uh, for those of you watching, make sure you go over to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash register, and that way you can get either our weekly or daily updates so you can follow along all the things that we're, we're reporting on here. And all the, the nullification-type news that we report on, bill reports, those are all over at the 10th or blog at blog.10thamendmentcenter.com. And of course, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you being here with us. Thanks for being here.